And we dig further into policing with our next guest, who is a leading scholar on law enforcement and race. Philip Atiba Goff is a psychologist and CEO of the Center for Policing Equity, think tank that collects and analyzes data to shed light on police behavior and fight implicit bias. He tells our Michelle Martin that making the police force match the times boils down to one key relationship. Thanks, Christian. Professor Goff, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. You are one of the foremost authorities on the issue of policing and race. How did you get interested in this subject? I mean, it seems in a way like a subject that's been hiding in plain sight, but you brought kind of a rigor to it that just wasn't there before. How did you get interested in this? I mean, honestly, I fell down the rabbit hole just a little bit before other people did. Um, <clears throat> when the, the nation was starting to talk about mass incarceration, I was in graduate school, and I thought that was the direction it was going to go. But in 1999, when I graduated college and moved to start my PhD, there was a very famous shooting, Mamadou Diallo. And what happened in that shooting shook not just the nation, but also the field of psychology. Because what happened, there were 41 shots put into his body, 41 shots fired. And they said that they saw a gun, but in reality, he had his wallet in his hand. Now, that's the kind of sort of cognitive illusion that psychologists love to be doing in laboratories. And all of a sudden, we realize the stuff that we do in the lab could matter in the world. We fast forward nine years later in 2008, I was writing a little something about policing. I thought policing was going to be part of my work. Um, and at the end of it, I wanted to add a statistic about police brutality or just police use of force of any kind. I started middle of the day, I ended 13 and a half hours later. And I got up and I walked home because I realized the reason I couldn't find that stat is because it didn't exist. So in a world where someone can get shot 41 times for a trick of the eye, <clears throat> that we didn't measure anything about the way that the state treats its most vulnerable, most oppressed folks, black folks, native folks, that seemed impossible to me. And I realized as I was walking home, this is just going to be what I do for the rest of my life. One of your early research subjects that got a lot of attention focused on misapprehension of the age of Black children. I mean, you started with Black boys. And one of your finding was that people in the sort of a target uh, research group, which was mainly, you know, white male, white male police officers, routinely misrepresented the age of Black boys. So could you just talk a little bit more about that and why that matters? So ours was the third um, of the sort of published studies to find something like that effect, but it was the most, no pun intended, arresting because it had uh, on-duty officers and it also had pictures of the boys. So you were literally looking at a 13-year-old boy and not just officers, but lay folks, college students and regular everyday citizens were seeing them as two and three and four and five and six years older than they were. And when we got the data back and we saw that Black boys were given an extra four and a half years, meaning someone who's 13 gets treated basically like an adult. We thought, wow, that's, that's really difficult to, to swallow. I'm not sure that that effect isn't just a, an accident of the, the subjects or an accident of, you know, the pictures we showed. But I believe later that year, it was in Cleveland, that Tamir Rice was shot and killed. And you hear clearly the officer saying, black male, 20 years old. Tamir Rice was 12. And that was part of how I knew the things we were getting in the lab were likely underestimations of what we're seeing, what people are experiencing in their lives. It's one of the things that has intrigued me about the current moment is that you're seeing two different sort of philosophies around policing and why these issues persist. On the one hand, you've got the, the bad apples argument. It's just some bad apples. And that they've got to do better at weeding out their bad apples. And yet you've got other people saying, no, this is a system problem. And the systems need to change. So talk to me about that. I mean, which is it? Your, is it bad animals or is it a system problem? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a question I'm getting a lot um, and have been since the, the, the Floyd murder was first captured and broadcast. Uh, I have to say, all of these conversations, the way that we frame them, I think, frankly, it's because it's easier to frame a conflict, which is what we're seeing in the streets, as if it's an ideological conflict or, or a, a, a group-based conflict. I got to say, that's not the way that we've done our research. That's not the way that we see the field. When I go and talk to cops for the last 12 years, and I'm a, I'm a black man from Philly, 
I did not imagine what my life was going to be police chief being like, oh, thank goodness, Dr. Racism's here. But that's what it looks like. They invite me in and they're like, all right, don't say this out loud. But there's some racist cops in here. Help me get them out. Also, we shouldn't be going in communities and acting like social workers. I don't want my cops trying to de-escalate a domestic dispute unless we think it's going to get violent. Why am I sending a badge and a gun to go deal with someone who's trying to kill themselves, right? That, they need mental health services. They need substance abuse services. Cops, chiefs all the time saying, what can I do in a community that has no grocery stores, no educational facilities, none of that stuff? How much of that sounds exactly like the protesters? And the chiefs have been saying this for decades. So this idea of, oh, not don't do incremental, um, we've got to defund versus, no, we have to be responsible, defund is, is, is lunacy. That's a distraction by people who profit from distraction. There is a straightforward adult path towards aligning our public safety systems with the values of communities. We should walk that path, and everybody trying to distract from it should go to bed so that the adults can do what the adults have to do. So I want to talk to you about what that path is, but I, but first I do want to ask you, why do we keep having, you know, a thousand people killed by police every year? So one piece of it is because the full humanity of Black people has been invisible since the founding of the country as it stands right now. Um, so if you can't see someone's humanity, you can't see the things that cause them pain. It's just illegible to you. But I think the deeper piece of this is we've never had a full accounting of the ways in which we have targeted Black communities for abuse and erasure. What we, I've been saying it now for weeks. What we've been seeing on the streets is not just a policing problem. It is a past due notice on the unpaid debts owed to Black people for 400 plus years. And since we haven't bothered to account for it, when you have a debt that keeps coming due, you're likely just to pay off pieces of the interest, none of the principal. So the reason it doesn't change is because we're not scaling our problems right, to the, the full measure of the issues. We're arguing about tactics when we first have to reckon with scale, right? If you want to say to me, oh, I think we can, we can kill this beast with a knife, and I say, no, we can beat it with a stick, right? A third person comes in and says, you remember the thing that you're trying to kill? It's 200 feet tall. Those tactics are not the problem. The problem is we haven't reckoned with the scale. And until we do, we're going to see it over and over and over again. That, that involves recognizing the full humanity of the people who've been speaking, centering our voices. But it also it involves an honest accounting of history, something this country has been notoriously terrible at since we started. So, so let's talk more about, you say, your path, the adult path here. Right. And so I hope you won't find me too terribly difficult, but the protesters are asking for policing and, right? So... There are, there's a range of things that people mean when they say defund the police, right? Some mean literal abolition. Communities can just take care of it themselves. But most of the protesters I talk to, most folks in Black communities that I know, want just less of a footprint. They want literally the same things the chiefs have been asking for for years. Scott Thompson, used to be the chief in Camden, uh, New Jersey, um, would, is want to say, give me a Boys and Girls Club, I'll give you back 10 officers any day, right? And it's that kind of thinking that is part of the adult path, right? We used to have mental health hospitals in this country, right? Now, they had a terrible history, right, and awful abuses, but there was public funding for mental health services, right? If you could get that right, you would have less of a need for law enforcement to be the only place you could call when something like that is happening. Right? We used to have um, significant investment in public schools. As that gets lifted up and thrown away and we privatize more of that, you end up saying, well, these folks are rowdy because they haven't eaten. Right? These folks are, are unruly um, <clears throat> because they have to go work jobs after school, starting middle school. And so we put police in there instead of nurses and counselors and doctors. Right? So the ACLU, um, uh, I think a couple of years ago, came out and said 14 million kids go to school in a school that has police, but no social workers, nurses, counselors. How on earth is that the, the, the right thing to do? Police have been calling for this. Now, because it comes with a slogan that feels scary to some people, people are intentionally not hearing what it could mean. Perhaps it's a ridiculous question. I mean, you say that the chiefs support this. When are they doing? So a lot of chiefs have actually been trying. Um, I think part of the reason why we see it is because it fits our narrative that cops are racist thugs. And for sure, I have met cops who are racist thugs. But across the country, a lot of chiefs have been embracing a number of these reforms. 
part of the reason why we haven't seen it is because culture change is hard. You have folks who have <clears throat> union guaranteed contracts. It's very difficult to fire them. So um, between 20, 2006 and 2017, um, about of the about 1,800 uh, officers who got fired um, in major cities, about a quarter of them got, had to be rehired because of the ways in which contracts were set up. So it's hard to fix the culture if the bigots can't get fired for being bigoted. That's a portion of it, right? The other part is that in major cities, at least, the average tenure of a, of a police chief is about two and a half years. So let's just imagine I'm a bigot and I see someone coming in trying to change the culture. I'll be like, I'll just wait them out. So that is not an excuse, but it's part of the reason why it's so hard, right? That said, I think, frankly, there hasn't been the kind of urgency where you say, if I'm only going to do this for two and a half years, I'm going to make sure that I really move the needle on culture and nothing else. So there hasn't been the outside pressure to say, if you don't get this done, we're going to hold you accountable to this value. And that, I think, is the thing that I want everybody to understand. We hire and fire police chiefs to manage the crime rate. The crime rate ticks up. It doesn't matter how wonderful they've been. They're out. We need to be thinking about hiring and firing chiefs and superintendents, commissioners, voting for sheriffs if they do justice. And it's that value that, that means we, the people, are going to give or withdraw our consent to be policed this way to the degree that we're having law enforcement within our communities. We haven't held them accountable to that value, and so it's really hard for them to focus on that value. You've also talked about a national database, the need for a national database. Talk more about that. So there's lots of talk of different kinds of national databases. The Center for Policing Equity um, owns the National Justice Database. This is the largest collection of police behavioral data in the world, which is a super humble brag. Right? There's not a lot of good data. It's not collected very widely and well. Um, and lots of places who talk about having it to have pieces and bits and, and small things. Remember, there's 18,000 roughly law enforcement agencies across the United States. 75% of them are 25 officers or fewer, and 1,000 are one dude. It's always a dude, right? So they don't have good data, right? But still, having it in one place allows you to start learning things about how police are engaging in communities. But the long and short is this. We've measured in this country everything that matters to us, right? Amazon and Target know when the family gets pregnant by what you're searching for online, right? Um, your, your newspaper, if they're, if they're a big newspaper, knows when you're thinking about canceling your subscription. That's how we get the ads that we get. It is a trillion dollar industry to gather data and know what people are doing. And we have measured next to nothing about what the state does to the sons and daughters of former slaves in this country. That should be an outrage. And why don't we? Because we haven't cared. Yeah. If we cared, we'd have measured it. Think about a single thing that you care about in your life. And if you really care, you measure it, even if it's only implicitly. What about national standards? for the use of force of national policing standards in general? So think about what police are tasked with, right? So a lawyer is tasked with deciding, making strong decisions about liberty, lawyers and judges. Liberty, who gets to be free? Doctors are entrusted with the ability to make good decisions about life. Law enforcement has both responsibilities, life and liberty. You can't lose your license as a doctor in one state and then be like, I'm just going to try doctoring again in this next state over. You can't lose your certification as a lawyer in one state and say, I'm going to try lawyering someplace else. But you can do that in law enforcement because we don't have a national registry and we don't have a set of standards that say, if you fall below these standards, we will not entrust you with that badge and that gun with the license to take away life and liberty. That is ludicrous. And law enforcement, by the way, has mostly been calling for the same thing for years. Here, we do see a difference between leaders and unions, because for unions, it ends up being a burden, and for chiefs, it ends up being liberating. liberating. You testified before the House. Uh, there is a piece of legislation put forth by House Democrats. So far, it is only so Democrats. What would it do, and what is your evaluation of it? So I encourage people to go to the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights website, um, at civilrights.org. Um, you can, can read all eight of the pillars there. And in the time we've got right now, I, I think I probably can't get into great depth into all eight of them. Um, but I think what's really important is that this is, each one would be almost unimag unimaginable three weeks ago, right? Each one of those eight pillars. <clears throat> it does things like put a federal ban 
on all neck restraints, something that many major cities have done. But this would allow for federal litigators to come in and say, enough, we have jurisdiction here as well. It calls for a national registry of fired officers, so that officers like Timothy Lohman, um, who killed Tamir Rice and had been referred for termination in the last department, he quit before he could be fired, and then was fired from Cleveland PD, and now still works in law enforcement someplace else. That couldn't happen, okay? Um, it calls for an end to qualified immunity. There's a list of, uh, again, eight things, all of which have either a strong moral values-based uh, reason for, for being there, or a strong scientific component, or both. Um, what would it do? Functionally, it would begin the first step process of allowing our federal and local governments to hold police accountable in ways that right now we fail to every single time there's a shooting. You've been doing this work for a long time. Does this feel like a different moment where there might be a, a large shift in the direction that you hope to see us go in? So that's a double barrel question. Does it feel like a different moment? It does. After Ferguson, about a quarter of the, the country said that racism and policing was systematic. Now we're up to 74%. I don't know where those 26% are looking, um, but the country has moved. We're talking about structural change and investment in black communities, where before we were talking about pattern and practice investigations in law enforcement. This is a different moment. Um, the people who I'm talking to in D.C. are talking about a need to act or losing the consent of the government, right? And we're seeing um, ideas floated from the White House on racial justice. So that's a different moment. So are we going to see lasting change? I don't know yet. Right? Like I, I've been saying over and over again, the most important thing that people who are newly awakened and engaged in these issues can do is strap in. Because for sure, there's going to be more dead bodies. For sure, there's going to be more hashtags asking for justice for the families and accountability for the person who can't get justice anymore because they're lying on the ground. For sure, we're not solving this so that George Floyd is the last one. We've already seen that that's not going to be true. So it will depend on how many of us decide to be adults and strap in for the marathon that is accounting for 400 plus years of targeted oppression. We've had a couple of weeks of people kind of getting it. I don't think that's equal. So we're gonna to need to put significantly more on the, on the side of the scale that's justice to bend that long arc of the moral universe. Professor Philip Atiba-Gant, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you, Sean.